989. Welcome to 989 on Health, where you don't need years of university to understand the latest news about health and related subjects. We've created a list of helpful links on today's topics at our website, level989.com, and you can also find those links in the podcast playing app you're using right now. This informal discussion shares our personal views. Don't rely on this podcast as an alternative to medical advice from a professional healthcare provider. For the full disclaimer, please see our website. I'm Mike Davalos, just an average Joe, and this gentleman here with me is anything but average. It's Brandon Weintraub, a primary care physician. Hello, Brandon, and good evening. And good evening, Mike. This episode is going to be a little different. We're going to describe and discuss a number of interesting studies and or news articles, and we have not spent the hours and hours of research that most episodes require. So this is going to be more of an off-the-cuff discussion. Our first mini-topic is not a fluffy article you'd find in People magazine. This is the results of a research study, which, of course, our listeners will find a link to in the show notes. It's from the National Center for Biotechnology Information Support Center. This one is about, well, you know, it's smarty pants stuff when I have to look up definitions just to understand the title of the article. But basically, in layman's terms, it's high risk of heart attack caused by taking aspirin, Advil, or Aleve. Brandon, I'm sure you're going to take issue with my rephrasing of the article's title. Would you like to tell us the actual name and break a few things down for us? The actual title of the article is Risk of Acute Myocardial Infarction with NSAIDs in Real-World Use by Asian Meta-Analysis of Individual Patient Data. Now, I actually don't take as much offense at your retitling as I could. It's actually probably pretty accurate in terms of what the average reader or listener might need to know. The article itself is actually exactly what it titles itself. It's a meta-analysis, which we've mentioned in the past, and just means that the researchers took a collection of already performed other articles and other analyses and kind of put them together into one giant study. So it's a study of studies. That would just mean it's as as good or as flawed as the studies it's based on. Precisely. And there's a, a pretty intense vetting process for most of these. In this case, what it ended up with is something along the lines of 61,000 individuals who actually managed to be part of this meta-analysis. So in terms of a, a pool of potential test subjects, that's actually pretty large for most modern studies. I guess the only additional thing I want to mention is I'm not positive that aspirin was actually included in this meta-study. I mentioned it because it is an NSAID. Yeah, and and so yes, I, I think aspirin would probably be, it's potentially included in the outcome of the results, but I don't think it's mentioned specifically. So Take it with a grain of salt in terms of aspirin being involved directly in some of the things we may discuss in a little bit here. Understood. So I'm going to quote from the article here. And forgive me, but I'm cutting out a lot of references to charts and graphs, a lot of talk about Bayesian analysis, ratios, statistical models, and other technobabble, just to bring some common sense out of this paper. So, quote, Taking any dose of NSAIDs for one week one month, or more than a month, was associated with an increased risk of myocardial infarction. That's heart attack. Greater risk of myocardial infarction was documented for a higher dose of NSAIDs. With use for longer than one month, risks did not appear to exceed those associated with shorter durations. So I guess that means it doesn't, it increase your risk, whether you take it for a week or a month, by about the same amount. Am I understanding that right? Correct. That's what I gathered from the article as well. Essentially, what they found is that if you take a specific dose, the lower doses still increase your risk for experience a heart attack. The higher dose you take does increase your risk. But if you take these medications for a week or a month or a year, the length of time that you're on the medication doesn't seem to increase it any more than it would already have been increased just by taking the medication at that specific dose for a week. Now, there are other already well-known side effects of taking NSAIDs. I know liver damage is one of the biggest ones, yes. Really, that kind of stands for almost any medication you're taking. Your liver and your kidneys are 
pretty much entirely responsible for removing any foreign substances or toxins from your body. So even if you're taking a medication that is supposedly fairly harmless, your liver and your kidneys are still going to be responsible for all the extra work that a long-term medication is going to cause. So with something like an NSAID, if you're taking them for a long period of time, they seem to hit your liver, which is really the major filter for that particular type of medication, pretty hard. It's probably best just to mention that you're looking at an increased risk of heart attack of at least 90% just from taking any of the NSAIDs, any of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is pretty scary. The reason I chose this article in particular is I think that most Americans at one point or another have taken an NSAID. It's just an over-the-counter medication that very few people even think of anymore. Here's here's your painkiller. Just take these for the next three weeks and you'll be fine. I used to, there was a period while we worked together that I was taking two Advil every three hours throughout the day just because I was, I don't know if I was hooked on them or what, but I was just, I was always achy. So I was just popping more and more. And unfortunately, that's becoming more and more common. And I have always personally been concerned about their use if for no other reason than you are using a medication to interrupt what is essentially a very key and useful function of the body. So short term, it can be okay, but more and more people are taking these drugs long term and more regularly. And anytime I see that, I'm immediately concerned that there's going to be long term risks. And so when I when I came across this article, it was not necessarily confirmation of my deepest fears, but it definitely displays that even something that is supposed to be completely innocuous, something easy for people to take that does not do a whole lot of damage to the body, even something as simple as ibuprofen or Advil or any of these other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can cause damage and increase your risk of serious side effects if you take them at high enough dosage or for long enough. Now, one thing I wonder is I was taking caffeine pills there for a good while, and you can only get the little box of no-dose or whatever. It's pretty small. You get maybe it's like eight or 16 pills or something. You can't buy, I'm sure like at a truck stop or something you can, but you can't just buy a giant jug of 200 no-dose. They control how much you use by selling it in smaller packages, but they do sell a big jug of Advil. You can get, especially the generic stuff, just a big 200, 300 pill bottle, uh, which you're a lot more likely to just be taking at least some every day. It's another one of those examples that once it's been accepted by the overall populace, it's almost as if it it has no risks and, and no concerns. Yes, caffeine is worrisome, but an NSAID is or can be just as, as concerning if it's not used correctly and used when needed rather than at every opportunity. Well, but my question is, if you could only buy a little packet of two Advil at a time, not not that it was controlled, but like that's how it was sold, in a little packet of two. I mean, I guess you could grab a giant handful of packs of two, but at a certain point that becomes unwieldy and you don't want to do that. So I wonder if something that simple help at all. Or would you just go online and find a big jug of it and be done? I guess my initial thought is that if they had been provided that way en masse from the beginning, it would probably be helpful. I think that because we have become to depend on NSAIDs as a regular aspect of our daily lives, I don't know that changing it now would have a useful effect. I think people would just go out and be actively engaged in trying to get as many of them as possible. I don't think they would suddenly curb their use. Unless it suddenly was illegal to do so, right? A lot of the article was very, I mean, I called it technobabble, but it was it was technical stuff. But I never did actually find the, the sentence or the paragraph that said, and here's exactly how it increases your risk. Oh, you won't. So they don't know. No, no. The meta-study, the focus of the meta-study was, and this is true for most meta-studies, I feel pretty confident in saying that. When you see a meta-study, what you're looking at isn't something that's going to give you a method of action. It's not going to give you a reason for something. Meta-studies are more 
focused on the statistical analysis, on the the links and the likelihoods of a large collection of data. But as a result, they don't have the ability to go into depth and try to really figure out exactly why what they're looking for is or isn't occurring. So this is less about, well, why is an NSAID making my risk of heart attack so greatly increased? And just kind of providing proof that, hey, statistically, yeah, you're going to be at more risk if you if you take them for a week or for a month. I'm not asking because I'm looking for a workaround. I'm asking because it, it's just, it's interesting. Okay, it's it's more dangerous. Is it because it's limiting inflammation and inflammation has an important role to play? And if inflammation is always suppressed, then certain other proper processes that need to happen can't happen or... Uh, I, I wish I had a good answer for you, but unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I have a feeling that even if we did our usual level of research, we would end up with the usual answer, which would be, oh. It's good to know, hey, if you take these pills and you have a risk already of heart attack, you're increasing your risk. By a significant margin. That's good to know. I mean, even if you can explain it to the little old lady who has heart problems, it doesn't really matter how the molecular chemistry works. It's just be like, Grandma, don't take too much Advil, okay? It's bad for you. And there's always going to be those cases where the pain is intense. There's there's reason to take an NSAID. This isn't intended to to scare people from taking them. It's more about being aware that when you take them, it's not that harmless pill that you take and you can ignore. Just like with everything else, make sure you're balancing the risks with the benefits. Anything else on the NSAIDs before we move on? Uh, yes, actually. What's interesting about these kind of meta-analyses is that they rely on a body of data to be able to actually perform the analysis. And towards the end of the article, the researchers themselves actually make mention of the fact that they were having difficulty finding a large enough amount of data and access to patient data to make their study easy. They listed it as one of the weaknesses of the study, that patients were not being willing to share their data, even in redacted form, so with the name and the personal information removed. I wish I could find it here really quickly just to read it, but I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm not seeing it. But honestly, to me, it almost sounded like they were whining. Oh, goodness, how dare patients not want to share their information freely and easily for every person who wants to do a meta-analysis. And it was worrisome enough to me that I wanted to make sure I brought it up, because the idea that a researcher is just is upset that patients have the choice to keep their information to themselves is horrifying to me. Your medical information is yours. If I have a medical condition and I could share my info and that could help other people, I should do it, especially with the rise of, of wearable tech. The Apple Watch can track your heartbeat, and it's already helped warn some people that they have heart issues, and they went and got checked out, and they did have heart issues they didn't know about. So I think this this kind of the squeamishness about sharing your data is probably going to fade. I don't know that it will necessarily fade. I also don't know that even if it is, I don't know that I want it to. There is no piece of medical data, there is no piece of information, personal information, that cannot be misused when people are lax, especially with medical data. Yes, ideally, if it's just being used for purely scientific, purely research-based, actually positive uses, great. All the more reason for people to share their information. But it's important to remember that not everyone out there is hoping to keep your best interest in mind. And it is very easy for companies that are doing this data aggregation to misuse your data. So I think it's important for patients to recognize that their data is their own. It may not always be exactly the same in terms of protection, but making sure to keep the patient's best interest in mind at all times, that's the goal. Not to just have freedom of information purely for any researcher out there who wants it. I'm just the average Joe here, but in my opinion, it's worth it, even if they get my information and then misuse it. In the end, if all the data points click together, 
It turns out that we got a lot of data that we didn't realize was going to be useful. But when we lay it all out in a pattern with a million other people with that same condition, it reveals some new avenue or approach or whatever. And I don't know. I think I think it's worth it. I don't know. It is too thorny a topic to cover because it goes into a whole slew of, of different things that are not medically based. So I'll save our listeners from having to go in depth with it. But would it be an ethics discussion at that point? I think it would certainly go into, at least in small part, an ethics discussion about data use and who has what to hide and what ought to be hidden and, and what protections ought to be in place. So long story short, I agree with you. If that data can make a even small steps in the right direction, it would be wonderful to be able to share it in confidence and know that it was going towards actually positive results. But in today's day and age, unfortunately, I think it's best to err on the side of caution, at least for now. And if the patient chooses that they don't want to share their data, they don't have to. Next up is an article from The Guardian, and it's about antibiotic use in animals. And now we're not talking about a little amoxicillin for your cat. To quote from the article, Farmers must be prevented from using powerful antibiotics on animals reared for food. The World Health Organization has warned, because of serious risks to human health, that result. New guidelines suggest farmers should stop using any antibiotics to promote growth and prevent disease in animals that are otherwise healthy, a common practice in some parts of the world, including Asia and the U.S. Using antimicrobial medicines on farm animals is one of the leading causes of the rise of superbugs, resistant to all but the strongest antibiotics. Medical authorities warn that the antibiotics available to treat even relatively minor human diseases are running out because of the rapid rise of such resistance. In some countries, as much as 80% of antibiotic use is on farm animals. The use of the strongest antibiotics, a last resort for the most deadly infections affecting humans, should be banned altogether in animals, the guidelines advise. This should apply, according to the WHO, even in cases where an illness has been diagnosed in a food-producing animal. Implementing this could require animals to be quarantined, allowed to die, or for herds to be culled in order to halt the spread of a serious disease rather than attempting to cure it. Animal herds treated with antibiotics can develop bacteria resistant to the drugs and pass this on to humans directly through contact with farm workers or through food. A Guardian investigation found that the superbug MRSA, M-R-S-A, was found in a significant sample of pork products on the UK supermarket shelves, risking humans becoming infected with the strain. It will be a challenge for producers to follow these recommendations to reduce antibiotic use but possible for larger-scale producers with good biosecurity. Many smaller-scale farmers around the world are dependent upon antibiotics to supplement animal feed, and actions will be needed to support them to make this change, which will affect their lives and livelihoods. Overuse of antibiotics is a major problem. Chances are that our listeners have at least heard within the last year or so something about how we're running out of new antibiotics to, to treat some of these Quote unquote superbugs. And a lot of these antibiotics are just being used in animals on a daily basis. Even some of the strongest and most viable antibiotics that we've got still, even for human use, are just being used to treat animals with diseases. And it means that we're creating these antibiotic resistant bacteria that eventually get passed on to humans. It's a really nasty situation. But it's not farmers. It's big business. It's not, I'll go down the street and talk to Uncle Jeb and tell him to cut back. It's big business. No, they make billions of dollars, and it's an essential part. They have food, they have water, they have antibiotics, they have pesticides. You know, it's just one of their tools that allows them to produce what they produce. And if you take any of those things away, you have huge problems. They have to completely redesign the system from scratch. Yeah, because it is such a big business, that's where the battle's going to come from. For some of the smaller producers, usually their animals are spaced out well enough, they've got enough room to wander, the herds are small enough that when you see one or two of the animals getting sick, effectively, these small-time farmers are already doing what the WHO suggests they need to do. 
So they take these animals from the herd, they either slaughter them ahead of time, or they're allowed to live out what lives they have left away from the rest of the herd. So the smaller farmers, like you said, it's not that critical of a change. But to these factory farms, there's no feasible way for them to continue in the ways that they've been producing these animals without these antibiotics. And possibly the biggest problem is that the WHO, the World Health Organization, it doesn't have any power to enforce its suggestions. So it basically did a big research study and said, this is a problem. Everyone needs to stop. And there is no way to enforce that unless the countries themselves are willing to take this information to heart and then do something with it. We're just going to see things get worse and worse. I don't know that there's a whole lot to be done unless people really understand the problem and are willing to actively engage their politicians and speak with their money in terms of what they want to buy and and what they want to support. It's kind of weird to think. I've seen a lot of sci-fi movies about how the world ends and using too much antibiotics on cows and chickens is is not usually one I, I don't think I've ever seen that particular story. One would think that We'll take a step back and we'll recognize that, yes, this is a concern. Let's go ahead and and make some significant changes, even if they are a little bit more expensive, to improve our food source. I think that's ideally kind of where everyone expects us to be. It's if the problem gets bad enough, surely we'll be intelligent enough to recognize that these antibiotic-resistant bacteria are becoming too big a problem and we need to do something about it. And So even in our wildest fantasies, in these horror movies and our sci-fi, we don't see ourselves succumbing to an antibiotic-resistant superbug, because surely we will have found a way to overcome it before it becomes a world-changing, world-ending disease. Mm -hmm. So I guess this one, long story short, I kind of selected this article because we have discussed it in the past, the concerns that these antibiotics in our factory-farmed animals are becoming more and more of a problem. And so, again, it's just kind of reinforced by a study by one of the fairly well-respected organizations in terms of health, not just for the States or for the for Europe, but for the entire world. The article's a downer, Brandon. I know. I was just thinking, let's improve things a little bit. Let's talk about something a little, uh, a little less depressing. That sounds good. We're going to go ahead and try to close up our discussion today with something a little bit shorter and hopefully a little bit more positive. Uh, We're going to discuss a medication that may or may not melt away all of the bad fat that's hanging out in your arteries, which, hooray, could be exciting, right? That sounds too good to be true. Are we going to go ahead and quote from this article at fortune.com? Scientists think they've discovered a new drug that can melt away heart-clogging fat. CNBC reports that researchers from the University of Aberdeen think that one dose of a new drug, trodusquamine, could completely reverse the effects of atherosclerosis, the buildup of fatty plaque in the arteries. The condition can cause a number of heart problems, including stroke or heart attack. The drug was initially developed to treat cancer and diabetes. Another cancer drug was recently discovered to have some heart benefits as well. Researchers have found that mice that are given a single dose of the drug have less fatty plaque in their arteries than those that have not had the drug. It's still in a preclinical level trial, but it seems to be working. Next, researchers plan to conduct human trials to see if the drug could potentially be used to help treat people with atherosclerosis. Separate trials are already underway to use the drug in diabetes and cancer care. Well, my first thought is it's too good to be true. I think that's pretty natural, yeah. And that it might get rid of some blockages in your arteries, but at the expense of one of your other organs. Keep in mind that the fatty plaque that builds up in your arteries, it's not just random gunk. Oftentimes that plaque is put down to kind of plaster over tears in vessels or to cover up something that actually needs to be covered up. It may seem like a great idea to just blast away all of the plaque in your arteries. You may end up opening up a whole slew of additional problems. And yes, I'm inclined to agree with you. Any drug that can blast away plaque in arteries is undoubtedly going to do damage to something else, and probably not in an insignificant way. Let's say it's stuck to the side of an artery, and it comes off. But now it's in the bloodstream, 
Could that cause a clot? Would that be problematic in the kidneys? Just having more of that stuff in your bloodstream that's been freed up from wherever it's been stuck to. Could cause significant risk. In the end, we have to wait until more studies are actually performed to see what happens with this fatty plaque that's being removed by this medication. If I had to guess, I would say that if it's given to people in cancer treatments, that if as those cancer patients die, let's say the cancer kills them, then you get an opportunity to do that autopsy and say, okay, now let's take a look at this defat drug and see what it's done to their arteries uh, while it was trying to kill their cancer, you know? Potentially. There's also the risks that you run when you've got a long term. Now it's 30 years later. What's occurred over the long term? So while those autopsies are great, I don't think we'll get the best results until and if these patients have survived for a certain period of time, and we can find out what kind of problems are caused on an actively functioning human body. Again, this is a amazing drug used in mice right now. So yet another story. It would be very nice to read a medical article that didn't say, oh, only in mice right now. Well, I also think it's interesting that it's like, okay, this is being tested for diabetes and cancer care. And those are two fairly different conditions. So are they just taking these drugs and it's like, yeah, we created this. Let's find out what it's good for. I've seen some footage of drug testing labs where it's like this robot arm with all these little squirters. And they squirt them in all these little tiny vials and they do it again and again and again and again, like thousands of times a day. And then they go back through and they look at all the little vials and say, wow, in this sample, this potency of this chemical, it killed all these cancer cells, but not the human cells. We might have something here. And so a lot of the initial results are very encouraging, but it kills you. (laughs) Yeah, Well, absolutely. I mean, that's how science progresses. I can't help but find it interesting that two of the hot button illnesses are what's mentioned in the article. Diabetes and cancer care, these are some of the biggest topics, some of the diseases that are discussed the most these days. I find it interesting that this drug just happens to be tested for the two big hot button topics. It's interesting that we have yet to have an episode on cancer. That is because for the most part, acupuncture physicians, legally we're not allowed to treat cancer. We can treat the symptoms of the cancer and of the chemotherapy and radiation, but we're not allowed to treat cancer. So for the most part, I try to stay away from topics that I don't have any right or any in-depth knowledge to talk about. So cancer is one of those that there's great things we can do to help patients feel better, but legally, I can't claim that as an acupuncture physician, I can help treat it. But you can say, you know, I read some articles and here's what they say. It doesn't hurt that cancer is such a a tricky and in-depth topic. Okay, let's talk about cancer. Well, which of the 8,000 kinds do we want to talk about? It's my personal inclination to leave cancer to those who treat it pretty extensively. It's not something I want to play with. Anything else before we move on? I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about it. I hope it just doesn't disappear into the night like many of the other medications that we see and hear about and then disappears and is never discussed again. That's all the time we have for today. These short episodes are a brief overview of very complex topics. Everything we say is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Licensed healthcare professionals should advise you and be aware of changes you're planning to make to any aspect of your healthcare. Every person's needs are different. The links to references we've made about news articles, medical studies, or other materials can be found at level989.com along with our contact information and the complete don't take medical advice from podcasts disclaimer. Don't forget to take a moment to rate or review us on iTunes or give us a mention on social media. We can't inform everyone if they don't know we exist. Thanks for listening and now go health yourself.